Hello, this is Todd Luck, and this is a review of Video Power. This was a show that came out in 1990, and it was really trying to cash in on the video game craze of the time. It had live action segments with a host named Johnny Arcade, and he would do previews and reviews of games at the time. And he also did a Video Power Edge. Uh, where he would give you tips on how to play the games and cheats and secrets and stuff like that. And then it also had a cartoon that would play during the episode called The Power Team, and that actually featured uh, different video game characters that would fight villains who had escaped into the player's world. And so that was the first season of Video Power, and then in the second season it actually completely changed formats and became a video game game show. And so this is a really big show and a really big review. And so I'm going to be dividing this review into several parts. And so part one will be focusing on the first season Johnny Arcade segments. And then part two will be on the Power Team cartoon. And then for the final part, we'll be taking a look at that game show for season two. And one quick note, this was a syndicated show, so it could have aired at any point if your station picked it up. Uh, for me, it aired in the afternoon, and I watched it every afternoon after I got home from school. Uh, James Rolfe over at Cinemassacre, in his review, he said it aired super early in the morning, so it just varied from station to station. And so let me give you some context for the time. So it was 1990, and so the Nintendo Entertainment System, the 8-bit NES, was going strong. It had created this incredible phenomenon of just a fervor for Nintendo games, and we had two 16-bit competitors coming in. There were more powerful systems trying to get in on that, and we had the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16. Now, this was before the internet as we know it, so if you wanted to know about these games, you needed to get it from old media. You needed to get it from print or television. There was all kinds of merchandise. You could get puffy stickers. The Nintendo comics from Valiant Comics was coming out at that time. And of course, games of that era were famously hard and they were cryptic in nature sometimes and they had all kinds of cheats and secrets in them. And so there was an entire industry built around telling kids, you know, what the games were like and all, what those secrets were. And so you had a ton of magazines like Game Players Magazine, and some of these magazines actually did sponsor segments on the show. You actually had books just filled with video game tips. You had all kinds of guides that came out at the time, but the crown jewel of it all, the gold standard, was Nintendo's own magazine, Nintendo Power. And so Nintendo Power would let you know about the games that were coming out with these beautifully illustrated articles. They had these wonderful maps that were built from screenshots from the games that were filled with tips and, you know, kind of walkthrough advice. And they had entire sections just telling you tips and cheats and all that stuff. And it was also an interactive experience. You could write in and ask them a question. You could send letters to them. Uh, you could vote on what game was popular and all that stuff. And it really kind of created a community amidst this phenomenon and kind of made it a shared experience. I think really helped kind of fuel that fire of Nintendo and NES fervor. But as amazing as Nintendo Power was, it did have its limits. It was a print magazine. It couldn't show us actual footage of the games that it was highlighting. And that's where video power comes in, right? They're trying to recreate that magazine experience, but with actual gameplay footage so you can see the games in action. And it did it to the point where they actually did have a way for the audience to interact. They actually had a P.O. box that Johnny Arcade would list that you could write in and ask him questions and do requests on. So they were really trying to build, you know, a kind of a community around the show. Ham Saban and Shuki Levy did the original music for the show, and they have so many classic children's shows of the 80s and 90s under their belt. Headmaster's Universe, Heathcliff, Inspector Gadget, Jason the Wild Warriors, Mask. If there was a catchy theme song in the 80s and 90s, it's a good chance they had something to do with it. Rewatching the show as an adult, I definitely have a greater respect for Johnny Arcade. Um, the actor really seemed to give it his all, even when the material 
that they were giving him was very mixed. The reviews he did played out as little skits and they would often end in a split screen with him playing two characters that would be arguing over just nonsense stuff like, or the graphics better or the controls or something and it, it just didn't really make a lot of sense. And then other times he would actually do the entire review in character and that usually worked out a little bit better. And the array of different impressions that he did throughout the season was very, very impressive. Super Monocle for the Sega Genesis. Okay, come back. Fall in. I'm here to tell you about Battle Squadron, a two-player cooperative shooting game for the Genesis. Greetings, space cadets. Let's blast off into the great beyond and explore the four corners of the universe with Fantasy Star 2. They're braving up with road blasters for the NES. This is like a post-nuclear road fantasy, you know? A totally wrecked out world where it's just you and your monster mobile against the hostile horde. Sounds like more neighborhood. But oftentimes the show would just fail Johnny Arcade. So for the first so many episodes, he would actually give detailed descriptions of the Power Team episode you're about to watch, except every single time the Power Team episode would be a completely different one than what he described. Uh, they would stop doing this in later episodes. I guess they just figured out they couldn't get it right. Um, there would be times when he would be given a tip and a completely different section of the game would be in the footage that they would show. They actually got the tip wrong in the first episode on how to get infinite shurikens in Revenge of Shinobi. And oftentimes the skits they wanted him to do in the reviews just weren't very well thought out. Probably the worst one was the review of Tiger Road. My martial arts master say it is a wise man who walks softly and carry a big kick. So I know my master would love the martial arts game Tiger Road for the Turbo Gothics. So yeah, that was a bad idea on so many levels. But I think the worst part of the show uh, that kind of diminished it was just the brevity of the segments. I mean, he would just spend like a minute or two on something and then move on to something else. It felt like he had ADHD. And probably part of that was there was a theory at the time that because of MTV videos, kids had short attention spans, so you had to constantly be changing things up, you know, and doing something different every couple minutes. Um, unfortunately, that really made the segments really brief, and, you know, you would watch something and you'd get just a little bit of gameplay, but before you could figure out anything about the game, the review was over and he was moving on to something else. That being said, I don't want to make it sound like it was all bad. There were actually some good reviews where some games that they spent a little bit more time on and that the viewer got something out of. And there were some clever stuff like this review of Clax. Here's a big difference between Clax and most other puzzle games. It has different levels. They're called waves. For each wave, you have a new objective. In wave one, you make three claxes. In wave three, they have to be diagonal claxes. In wave eight, you have to get 55 tiles to disappear. It's a different, slightly harder job each time around. There are, count them, 100 waves in Clax, and you've got to be pretty skillful to get up to the teens, so you might just still be trying to beat this game when you're about 85 years old. Uh, uh, it's a real classic puzzle, a simple idea with a million possibilities, and it's available for pretty much every system you have, even old computers! Uh, 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 I hate that! Uh, give it a try. And by the way, in case you're wondering, those are gift boxes that he was using. My favorite review is definitely the Splatterhouse one. He came in like this when the show opened. <laughs> and then proceeded to do the entire review as Vincent Price. I've got a special review on a new game for the TurboGrafx-16. It's a really nice, pleasant little game. <laughs> It's called Slatterhouse. And actually showed a decent amount of footage during the review. Here in the dungeon, even the chained up zombies will try to get you. Even dead bodies aren't safe. Watch out for the giant leeches that rise up from the rotting corpses. I love those guys. Level 2 has a slimy sewer, and level 3 is the evil forest where you fight off zombies and wolves. You search the Hall of Mirrors, the library. And that review stuck in my head because when I got a Wii, uh, the first TurboGrafx-16 game I got off the virtual console was, of course, Splatterhouse. 
And some of the tips were pretty good too. Uh, there was this Minus World tip in Super Mario Brothers, the uh, Helicopter Door tip in Double Dragon 2. And sometimes they would actually spend longer time and give you several different tips during the Video Power Edge. And one of those times was with Tetris. And it's very basic stuff, you know, start building on one side to try to get a Tetris. If it gets too tall, then you need to start focusing on individual lines to get it to back down. Uh, but if you think about it, back in the day, no one had played Tetris before. And so if you didn't have the instruction booklet, which was very common if you rented it, or you didn't have that Nintendo Power issue talking about it, you needed to know that stuff. So it was a really a good basic guide to Tetris, and it even included the little cheat where you could uh, press start during the demo when it was getting the Tetris, and then when you started your game, it would give you that Tetris for free. I actually got out my old Tetris cartridge and tried that out because I was like, I don't remember that, and then I did it. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that from back in the day. And so watching it nowadays is kind of surreal because Johnny Arcade was really the precursor to Angry Video Game Nerd and all the YouTubers that he would inspire. He was doing these skits and all these characters for reviews, which, you know, we would see all over the place nowadays. The big difference is that YouTubers understand the audience's attention span much better than studio executives did back in the 90s. You know, we know that people would rather sit through a thorough review of something than just watch a minute or two video that just wastes their time. So the live action part of the show was flawed but very interesting and I really applaud them for even trying what they were doing. Um, they really did have some really big goals and aspirations for it um, and it was still really cool and really thrilling even if it, sometimes it was brief to see the footage play on television like that. And, you know, if you're interested in games of that era, uh, you might want to give them a try because uh, the segments oftentimes would remind me of games that I had forgotten. And so it's just really cool to kind of, you know, see, you know, what was out there at the time. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the show and the fact that the characters that appeared in it, you know, were owned by various different companies that declared bankruptcy. I'm not sure if we'll ever see a release of the show on streaming or DVD. Uh, the way to watch it now is, unfortunately, you have to just watch unofficial, you know, fan uploads on YouTube or various other sites. However, watching it can be very confusing because there will be times at which the Power Team segment of the show goes into reruns, but the Johnny Arcade segments will be new. And so to clear up that confusion, I think I need to give you my own video power edge. So you want to watch video power. So what you want to do is you want to find a playlist of video power episodes that has 33 episodes. That's how many episodes were made. Now, the thing is, episodes 1 through 15 are going to be all new. But then you're going to get to that 16th episode and the power team will start going into reruns. And so what you could do is if you just want to see the new Johnny Arcade stuff, you could just skip the Power Team episode. But let's say you just want to see the only the episodes that have the new Power Team segments. So what you'll do is you're going to watch 1 through 15, and then you're going to skip forward to episode 27 and then watch the rest of the series. And that way you'll see all the new Power Team episodes. And now you have the edge, the video power edge. So that's it for my first part of my video power review. I will be back with part two, talking about the power team cartoon that played in the first season of video power. And then I'll also be doing a last part on the video power game show that was season two. So like and subscribe for more videos. And until next time, Game over.